Hey, this is Mike, and this is another video in our series on ML model training and fine tuning. In this video, we are going to collect, prepare, and annotate data for use in model fine tuning. Then eventually we will take that annotated data and use it to train a model. Before we actually start building anything, I'm gonna cover why we might want to fine tune a model and what that process looks like. If you're already familiar with that, feel free to skip ahead using the chapter links below. In previous videos, which I can link to, we use something called Retrieval Augmented Generation or RAG to pass our specific content to a model and have it make sense of that data on the fly. And that's certainly a viable solution. And fine tuning or training your own model shouldn't be considered an either or scenario. When you combine Retrieval Augmented Generation with a fine-tuned model, you can get some pretty impressive results. The advantages of fine-tuning, one, you have this uniquely ownable product offering that solves a specific use case. As we saw in OpenAI's keynote where they rolled out personal GPTs, it's getting harder and harder to just build an app on top of the big player's APIs and create a business out of that. So fine-tuning definitely comes into play there. Other reasons, better performance through smaller models. Uh, better accuracy, reduced hallucinations if the model is fine-tuned or trained properly, and the ability to build in a voice or a branding or a focus into your solution. So what are the steps in training or fine-tuning the model? Well, first, we need to gather the data that we want to train on. Second, we need to standardize that data and clean it, make sure it's all consistent. Then we need to annotate it or label it so that the machine learning model understands the different components and how they're categorized and how they differ from each other or how they're related. Then we need to split it into a training set that the model will train on and an evaluation test set that we can use to figure out if the model did a good job or a bad job. Then we actually train our model once we have that. And then of course, once it's trained, we can implement it for our specific use case. So for the purposes of this video, our specific use case is we want a model that understands the nature of podcast transcripts. Transcripts have a unique structure. They have dialogue, ad content. They have sponsors and stories, music and sound. Uh, they have time-based content. We want the model to know how to recognize those things when it sees them, how to differentiate between them, how to know what's important, what's not. I've previously been using the technique of retrieval augmented generation and just sort of passing these transcripts on the fly to the chat GPT model, but it doesn't always do the best job of knowing what's important. Uh, specifically, it tends to pull from the beginning or end of the episode where all the sponsors and all of the ad content exists, not the middle where all the good stories and uh, conversations take place. So. I'm going to attempt to fine tune to get better quality out of my model. So in previous videos, I showed you how to gather data programmatically through autonomous AI agents and through scrapers such as Bardeen or Adept that can get data that you can use as a data set to train your model. I will link to those, but for the purpose of this video, we already have that data. It's in a fairly standardized format because we downloaded SRT transcripts and they have a very predictable structure. So we don't have to do a lot of data cleaning. But what we do need to do is get that data into a format that our annotation tool can understand. And then we need to actually annotate that data. So I'm going to cover how to get the data into the proper format, uh, how to do that without having an extensive amount of code knowledge. We're actually going to build a transcript to JSON converter. Then we're going to take that data and feed it into Label Studio, our annotation tool. So I'll show you how to install Label Studio, get it up and running, ingest that data, and how to start annotating the data in a way that will make model training hopefully more accurate and uh, successful. So let's get started. This is a transcript that I got by using OpenAI Whisper. I passed it a podcast MP3. It transcribed the episode, and this is the format that it generates where we have the line number, the time segment in which these words were spoken, and the actual words spoken. And as you can see, our first 
bunch of lines here are all about Ray-Ban, Meta, smart glasses. And so that's one of the things that I want to kind of train the model on is that, that I, hey, all this stuff about sponsors and this banter that's happening in the beginning of the podcast is not important. The, the important stuff is down here where they start to talk about like the firing of Sam Altman, for example, in this episode. So we want the model to be able to understand the differences between all this stuff. OpenAI Whisper is what we use to transcribe it. You can read about it here. It's pretty good. It's pretty fast. It is not free, but it's easy to set up. And I have videos showing you how to use Whisper as well. So this is the format I want to get my data into where I have for each line, podcast name, the podcast episode, the line ID, the start time, the end time, and the content. Now, how do we get from this to this. For some of you, you might not be as familiar with writing code to accomplish this sort of transformation. So I'm actually going to show you how you can do it using ChatGPT to write your code for you. This, I think, will be useful in that it will show you how to teach a large language model to solve a complex problem by taking it step by step through something. So this is my conversation with ChatGPT, and I will post this so you can look at it in more detail. But essentially what I'm doing is I'm giving it an example of what a transcript looks like. And then I'm giving it some information about Label Studio and their desired format. So they have an XML format where you get this view and you get some text blocks. And those text blocks are the different pieces of your transcript. So we have the content itself, the timestamp, the ID, et cetera. And you can see here, ChatGPT, once I provided this information, is actually just generating a bunch of code for me to get us from that SRT format to that JSON format that we want. So without even looking through this, let's just see what we get when we run this code. We're going to copy it, go over to Visual Studio Code, open up a terminal window, make a new file. I'm going to put this inside of my server directory and I'll call it srt.py. It's going to be a Python script. And I'll just paste in what they gave us, save it. And now in my terminal, I'm going to run it. And you can see it has given us an array of objects with an ID, a timestamp, and a transcript. So it has actually given us working code. We don't see any errors. So let's look at this code and figure out what it's doing. It's importing a Python module called JSON. It's got a function called SRT to JSON, where we're passing in our SRT content. It's our transcript. And then it is stripping all the white space, putting it into different entries based on each double new line. So if we look at this, that's this here. It's setting aside an array for all that JSON data. And so within each entry, the line is going to be separated by a single new line. So again, here, line number, new line, timestamp, new line, content. It's identifying which is which. Remember, our arrays are zero indexed. So zero is the first, one is the second, et cetera. And then it's making an object of these three different properties and passing it into the JSON array. Now, our content is defined in this big string here, but we don't want to have to paste that in each time. So I know I'm going to need to modify this script that they gave me. I also know that it's just displaying the output. It's not saving it to a file or anything like that. So that's another modification we're going to need to do. So again, if you're good with code, feel free to modify the script directly. Otherwise, go back to ChatGPT and explain what you need done. So here I'm asking it to modify this so it accepts an SRT file instead of just a big long string with all of our transcript content in it. And it gives us another code block. So let's try that. Copy it. We'll replace this. We'll run it. Oh, it needs an argument with the SRT file. So we need to tell it where to find that file. I have a transcript here in this assets folder, but we're in the server folder. So let's let's actually switch to our project root and we will say Python 3 server slash SRT.py. That's where our script is. Assets DFT.SRT because that's where our transcript file is. And now again, we get output and this time we've got all the stuff inside our transcript here. So we can actually look at what has changed between those two scripts by just pasting in the old content. So if I undo here, copy this, make a new file. I have an extension called diff tool. I'm going to mark this as the first file, mark this as the second. And you can see this red stuff is things we've taken out. 
So now we have this main function and it's using argparse to take the argument for where the file lives and pass it on to our function. But it's still just printing it in the terminal. It's not downloading a file. So let's go back to ChatGPT. We say, now modify that so that rather than print it, it downloads the file as a JSON formatted document. It gives us some code. I'm gonna copy that code. Again, we're gonna replace what we got, save it, run it. And it says JSON file saved as assets, dft.json. And now we have a file. So again, let's look at the diff between this version and the last version of code that we had. And it looks like we've just got this one small change here, which is rather than printing out the result, we are saying here is our output file path, which is the same as the input file, but we are subtracting the extension and adding .json. So instead of SRT, we've got .json. We write to that path with UTF-8 encoding, and then we just print a little message to the user that the file has been successfully saved. Okay, this is all well and good if I'm the only one uploading these transcripts. But if I want to give someone else who maybe doesn't have the code base installed, the ability to generate these JSON files, I want some sort of user interface. For this, what I really like that's very easy to install is a framework called Gradio, which creates user interfaces. And if you've spent any time on Hugging Face, you've probably seen Gradio at work. So what does this look like? I've created this Gradio space on a hugging face that converts SRT files to JSON. You're more than welcome to use it. It's open source. And you can just come in here, drop an SRT file and tell it the name of your podcast, tell it the name of your episode, hit submit, and you get a JSON file. Open up that file. There you go. Easy peasy. So how do you build one of these Gradio interfaces? You might be thinking, oh, great. Here's another thing I have to learn. But we're just going to take the same approach that we did with our script to convert SRT to JSON to build a Gradio interface. So let's hit up ChatGPT. Here's my same transcript. And now I'm asking it to build me a Gradio interface. And I described the things that I want in that Gradio interface. So looking at this, we want an upload field. We want to be able to specify the podcast name and the episode. And our SRT already has all the rest of the data that we need. And then we want it to output a JSON file that we will also be able to save. So I'm telling ChatGPT all of those requirements. So again, you don't have to use ChatGPT. If you know how to code, you can dig into the documentation. Gradio has really great documentation and you can just look up the different things that you want to add to your interface and copy their examples tweak the code yourself. But if you're not a coder, if you prefer to use AI, or if you want to use some combination of both, which is what I did, that's perfectly acceptable. I'm not going to go through it all, but the rest of this conversation with ChatGPT is just me refining this script to get where I want to go. So it's a lot of back and forth about like, okay, now we have this. How do I change it to add this or modify this? And eventually, it gives me some code that's pretty close to where I want to go. It may have some bugs. I definitely encountered a couple in this conversation, but I knew enough about code to be able to tweak it to do what I wanted it to do. So let's just look at the final script and walk through it. Some of this is going to look familiar from what we walked through already. Some of it's going to be new. These are our imports of all of our dependencies. JSON and OS are built into Python, so you just need to import them. You don't actually need to install them, but Gradio is not. So in order to install Gradio, you need to type pip install Gradio. Pip is a Python package manager. Also need to install pip, but if you've done any Python work already, you probably already have pip. If you type in pip and it gives you a list of all the different options, then you've already got it installed. I'll post a link to where you can go to install pip. If we wanted Gradio, we would just do pip install Gradio. So I've changed some of the variable names. The function is now called process SRT. It accepts three arguments, the file path, the podcast name, and the podcast episode. So 
from our interface, that's the fields we have. Transcript, podcast name, podcast episode. I'm telling it I want the output for our JSON file to go to my downloads folder. This stuff's the same. We're swapping out the SRT extension for JSON. Here, we're saying if that directory downloads doesn't exist within our project root, add it. So if it's the first time you're doing this and you forgot to make this folder right here, then it will make it for you. The rest of this stuff is the same except for the timestamp. What I've in my conversation with ChatGPT asked it to do is say, I don't want just the timestamp as a range of start to end time. I want to actually create a JSON structure where the start is one item and the end is another. So I'm saying split it into two entities. Looking at this, that's our split. So on the left side of this is our start, right side is our end. And then to this transcripts array, we're going to add an object where each SRT file is going to append the podcast name, podcast episode, line ID, time start, time end, and the content. Why am I going through all this? Because your data format is going to be different. Your needs are going to be different. As long as you understand how to generate the output you need, you're good. Now, that's the functional part of converting an SRT file to JSON, but where does the Gradio stuff come in? Well, you might expect all of that interface code to be much more complex, but it's actually just these few lines of code here. If I were to write this as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for a website, it would be way more than this, but Gradio handles all of that stuff behind the scenes. So we're declaring a variable called interface, Anytime you see GR, that's referring to Gradio. And we're saying, when this interface loads, call this function, which is the function we just walked through, process the SRT. And the inputs we want to create are these three things. The file, so there's that file. A text box for the podcast name and a text box for the podcast episodes. And then we're saying we want an output. Here's our output. And we're giving it a title, SRT to JSON Confer, which we see up here, and a description, which is just our instructions to the user. Now, if you wanted to customize the look and feel or the layout of this stuff, you can totally do that with Gradio, and there are docs on how to do that. But for our purposes, we're just going to let it intuitively lay out the interface the way it feels is appropriate. So now that we've got that file conversion piece out of the way, we're ready to start importing our data into Label Studio and creating the sort of textual segmentation and labeling that we need. So there are plenty of docs for Label Studio. It's got a little quick start here on how to install it. It's telling you to install it with pip. I actually found the documentation here on their GitHub repo, and they have a segment on how to install it with Docker. If you haven't used Docker before, it is a way to deploy code bases so that anybody who uses it has all of the dependencies that they need. If you were to just use pip install label studio, it's assuming a lot of things. If you have pip, it's assuming you have Python, it's assuming that all of the versions are right. Docker can sometimes be a lot easier for this kind of stuff. So I do have Docker. If you're familiar with Docker, feel free to skip over this part. I'm not going to go into too much depth, but on Docker's website, you can download the desktop app. There's also a command line interface. But when Docker is running, you can create or pull down Docker container. A Docker container being all the stuff that you need to run an application. So it makes it really easy for you and other people to work on the same code base. Think of Docker Hub like GitHub, just a source for code that you can find and run on your own system. If we go to the documentation for Label Studio, they're telling us you can pull down their code from Docker Hub and their code exists here. So if I search Docker Hub for that, here it is. And it gives me the command I need to run. So 
by copying this code and running it on our system. While Docker is running, we can pull down Label Studio and run it on our own system. If you installed it with Docker, this is the command you're going to run in order to launch Label Studio. If you installed it with pip, you're just launching with this command label studio. Regardless of the method that you use to launch it, it's going to start a server up at localhost 8080. So let's type that into our web browser. Here we are in label studio. Now I've already imported this data set so that you can see what a project with data looks like. We've got our line numbers. We've got our timestamp start end and our content. And if we open one of these up, I've already done some segmentation here on this piece of the transcript. So I've set up a bunch of different labels for the different content types. These can be whatever you want, and I'll show you how to configure that. But I've set up these basic labels. Things that are important, things that are advertisements, things that are a conversation between two people where a fact is represented, where a reference to maybe another product or service is mentioned things that are credits for people involved in the podcast, places where music or an interlude is playing or sound, and then things that are just not useful, like someone stuttering or dead air. All of these labels could potentially be useful to my machine learning model to learn in order to formulate better responses to my questions. So how did I set this interface up? Well, if we go to our settings here, there's some basic configuration you can do. Label Studio actually has some great YouTube videos about how to use it and what all these things mean. We have selected sequential sampling, meaning we can go one by one through all of our data and label it. Random sampling would be something where you might enlist people to label data and they would just get a random unlabeled piece of data to fill out. But what's important is our labeling interface here. And there's this visual interface and a code interface. I've actually used the code interface and gone to the trouble of reading the documentation on Label Studio and understanding what these mean. This syntax here is basically XML syntax. So if you've used XML or even HTML, you understand how this works. We've got our view. It is giving us a place for the podcast name, the episode, the line ID, and then here are our labels. So we're saying, let's give the interface a content type header and then the choice of all these different labels. And you can see the labels have hints. So if I were to hover over each one of these, it gives us a little more context to understand when we might want to assign that label. So if you have users labeling your data, that can be super helpful. The hint for important is a key tape away from the podcast episode. And then you can specify your colors too. And with the visual interface, this can actually be a little bit easier. We can kind of just use the color picker here to change our, our color slightly. For the value of each of these fields, we're mapping it to our data variable name. So podcast name, there it is. Podcast episode. Same as this. So we need to make sure if we want that stuff in Label Studio that it has to map to the data that we're going to be feeding it. But as far as these labels, these are things we're creating from scratch. The syntax here is value can be whatever you want it to be. The alias is what it actually assigns as a variable name for the code. So here you notice we have an intro outro. It's going to read intro slash outro, but the alias is going to be intro underscore outro. You don't have to put in an alias if you don't want to. You don't have to put in a hint if you don't want to. You don't have to put in a background color. Label Studio will assign its own colors. So that's our Label Studio interface. That's all there is to it. To figure out how to configure Label Studio for your use case, you can ask chat GPT, or you can just go through the docs in the tags section of the documentation they have all the different tags that you can use so we're mostly dealing with text but label studio is especially useful if you are trying to label audio or images it allows you to make bounding boxes around images to identify say what is a human versus an animal uh, within audio we can select pieces of a waveform and say this is drums this is guitar things like that
we are mostly working with text. Within text, we can see all the different parameters we might use, name, value. You can see here we use granularity. What's granularity? Well, that's this here. It's saying we can either just apply a label to this whole block of text, or we can assign our labels to pieces of the text. So I choose a label here, story. I highlight which part of this is a story, and then I label it. Same thing with the reference. StyleGAN, DeepDream, and Style Transfer. those are all references to different types of machine learning models. Now, again, I didn't do this entirely from scratch. I went to ChatGPT. I said, give me some label studio code that does the following things and did some refinement. Now, I had less success with ChatGPT giving me good, valid label studio code. It did things like introduce these rows, which do not exist in label studio code. They may have at one point and been deprecated, which is why it was pulling them. As you may know, ChatGPT, because it's such a large model, it only gets retrained on current data every so often. So uh, for a while, it was a couple years out of date. So if this API had changed, if the code had changed, it wouldn't know that. And it would still try to tell you things like use row, but row does not exist. Assuming you're starting from scratch, you'd want to create a new project. That's all we need for this. For our data import, let's go ahead and upload an initial file. Just pick this one here. And for our label studio labeling setup, we're going to use a custom template. And this is where we can either use the visual editor or the code. And if we go to settings and look at our label interface in the code, again, this is the code that I ended up with. I'll make that available to you. So the rest of the process of preparing our data for model training is just a ton of labeling and annotation. And that is no exception or any of the large language models that you see out there. A ton of work went into labeling and annotating and cleaning data. And you can see this is just one podcast transcript and not even a real podcast. So it's only four minutes long. If we were to take an hour long podcast, which is not exceptional, we might need to label and annotate all that data. And generally speaking, the more you accurately label and annotate data, things like ChatGPT were trained on just tons and tons and tons of label data. So that's it for this video. What's next? Again, if we go back to our process documentation, we need to split all of that labeled data out into a training and an evaluation set, and then feed it to our model and start training. And hopefully, if we've done our job well, we'll end up with a fine-tuned or trained model that is really good at answering questions and understanding podcast transcripts. Thanks for watching.